So let me talk about the, the fourth obstacle. <clears throat> the fourth obstacle, I think, is, is really very much mental. You may not know this guy. Some of you do, I can tell. But you may know this game. So the game in the UK is called Deal or No Deal. But I, I know this game originally came from the Netherlands, like all bad television. The Dutch created it. Big Brother, everything. It's always the Dutch. And it's, they've spread it across the world. So it's everywhere. It's, it's in Brazil. It's in America. It's everywhere. I don't know if it's in France. Maybe, you have so, maybe there's a French exception. But maybe, no, you have Deal or No Deal? Yeah, yeah, it's everywhere. So what's interesting about this game is in this game, you can see people making high-stakes decisions. And the rules are always the same. So you can start to analyze statistically what, how people are behaving in Deal or No Deal. So let me tell you a little bit about how the game works. Maybe some of you are big fans of the game. If so, I apologize. But if you don't know how the game works, let me explain. So the player has a box, and that box has got some money in. So maybe it's um, five euros, or um, one dollar. Or maybe it's a big price. Maybe it's um, here, 250,000 pounds. I don't know what the exchange rate is. I think that's now about um, three euros. So um, in the Dutch original version of the game, it's 500,000 euros, half a million euros. But in any case, you, you have this amount of money in the box. And probably, you can see, probably not much. But maybe it's one of those few big red prizes at the end. So what do you do now? Well, now all the other boxes with all the other amounts of money, they're all there in the studio. In the Brazilian version, they're all being held by women in bikinis. Um, <clears throat> we don't do that that way in Britain. But anyway, basically, the rules are the same. So you point to a box, and the box is opened to reveal how much money is in it. And then it's removed from the game. So if you point to a box, they open it, and it's 10 cents. Everyone cheers. Hey, great, it means 10 cents is gone. You didn't have 10 cents in your box. But if you point to a box and it's opened and it's 100,000 euros, everyone groans. You could have had 100,000 100, euros in your box, but no, it's gone. So all of this is pure luck. Now comes the interesting decision. From time to time, the banker, who is a horrible, horrible man, I don't know why, will call you on that telephone. And he will offer you money to stop playing. So he's offering to buy what's in the box. The banker doesn't know what's in the box. You don't know what's in the box. Nobody knows what's in the box. But you can see the other boxes slowly disappearing. You start to understand what might be in the box. So the banker will make you an offer. And you have to decide, deal or no deal. The way people play this game has been analyzed by behavioral economists, including Richard Thaler, the, um, the author of Misbehaving and, and Nudge. And what they found, I think, really tells us something quite deep about how we react in certain situations. So let me tell you the story. This is a true story, the story of Frank. He's Dutch. He's playing the game. He's discarded loads of boxes, F four boxes there. One box in front of Frank. One of the boxes has half a million euros. The others, not much. So what is the expected value of the game? Mathematically, it's easy to calculate. 500,000 euros plus a bit divided by five is 100,000 euros plus a bit. So that's the value of the game, but it's very unevenly distributed. It's all in one box. So the banker phones Frank and says, I will offer you 82,500 euros to stop playing. Deal or no deal. So Frank thinks about it. And Frank, I think, reckons, if I choose one more box, get rid of it, then the banker will have to come back and offer a better deal. Like I can, the real value is 100,000. 
The offer from the banker is 82 and a half thousand. So I, I have to pay 20,000 euros to make all the risk go away. I'm going to take a bit more risk. So Frank says, no deal. Okay, that's the, there's no right or wrong. It depends on your attitude to risk. Frank picks a box. The box is opened. 500,000 euros, gone. Then the phone rings. And it's the banker. He's very happy. And the banker says to Frank, my new offer is 2,500 euros. So, if Frank was being completely rational and forward-thinking, he would say, four boxes, there's not much money, 2,500 euros is a good offer. In fact, it's almost exactly the fair offer. I can make the risk go away, and I don't have to pay for it. I should take this deal seriously. It's a good deal. That's not what Frank's thinking. Frank's thinking two things. Number one, I hate the banker. <laughs> Number two, I hate myself. I hate myself, the stupid decision I made. I could have had 82,000 euros, and I said no. And now look at the situation I'm in. So Frank got angry with the banker, with himself, with the game. Frank lost his mind. Frank said no. And the next offer from the banker was better than the fair value of the game. So I will pay you extra money to stop taking risks. It's like an insurance company that writes you checks in order for the rights to offer you insurance. Frank says no. Final choice. Frank is going to have either 10,000 euros or 10 euros. And the, the banker offers Frank 6,000 euros to stop. And Frank says no. Frank leaves the studio with 10 euros. The point is, it's very easy to be frank. This is actually, this is human behavior. We get very angry when we face up to the decisions we've made, and those decisions suggest we've made a loss. So the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, identified this tendency. It's, he called it loss aversion. Not, not the anger so much, but just the reluctance to accept an offer where you can see that you are, you are down on the game. You don't want to stop when you're down on the game. You want to keep going. You want to keep gambling. And we see this in the statistics for deal or no deal. It's not just Frank. This is how people play. If the bank, Frank is an extreme example. But if the banker's offer falls because you opened a really nice box, banker's offer falls, people hate to accept that. Even if it's a good offer, they think it's lower than the last offer. I don't accept this. We see it in stock market investors. We see it in professional poker players. We see it in um, housing markets. We have very good evidence on, on this. And of course, we see it experimentally in the lab. And you can see it when you look, to, look around at your colleagues. You can see a colleague who made a decision pushed a project, it was worth trying, it didn't work. And then they keep pushing. They spend more money, more time, more political capital, because they don't want to say, I made a mistake. I stopped the game. It's very easy to be like Frank. And Daniel Kahneman says, you, you can't make good decisions until you're able to make peace with your losses. So that's really the, the final obstacle to making good mistakes. Remember the first one, we all think the same, we're in a group, we don't try something new. The second one, we make a mistake and then we don't collect the data or we don't ask for feedback, so we don't know it's a mistake. The, the third obstacle is we learn over the mistake, but it's too slow, it's too expensive. We should have learned quicker. And the fourth obstacle is Frank's problem. We, we make a mistake, we make a loss, and then we just lose our minds. And, and get so angry, we, we make the mistake much, much worse. I think there's a solution to all of these problems, but the, the, they're, not, they're not easy to solve, because they, this is all how we are as human beings. But being aware of them means perhaps you can solve them. And I want to give you one final example of what happens when you try to confront these problems. 
because I promised I would come back to Twyla Tharp. Remember, she's been humiliated by the media. She's got a disastrous show. Billy Joel doesn't want to touch her. It would be very easy for her at that point to say, like Frank, I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm Twyla Tharp. These reviewers, they don't understand anything. The Chicago audiences, they don't understand. In New York, people will appreciate me. And in any case, I don't need to change. I've won prizes. I've worked with everybody. Why should I change? Would have been easy to do that. Um, what Twyla Tharp did instead was the morning the reviews came out, she sat down with a very old friend, Jennifer Tipton, who is a lighting designer. They worked with each other for 30 years. And they sit there over breakfast, croissant, coffee, orange juice, and the newspapers. And Twyla Tharp looks at Jennifer and she says, what do you think? And Jennifer Tipton looks her straight in the eye and she says, you know they're right. You know they're right. It's a very difficult thing to say. You're dealing with an old friend, a trusted colleague. All of these terrible things have been written about her. And you say, no, nope, they're right. It is a terrible show. But I think Twyla Tharp, she knew that's what Jennifer might say. That's why she trusted her, to give her the feedback she needed to, to hear. So she's got away from groupthink already. She's already been pushed to change, not to stick like Frank did, but to change, to do something new. But then she has to learn very quickly from this feedback because she hasn't got much time. She's just got weeks before the new show goes to Broadway. So how do you change a show so in, in that speed? So then she said she wanted to take the emotional energy out of the criticism. And she asked another colleague to go through all of the reviews and to turn the reviews into a spreadsheet. Just list all the problems with the show. Highlight the ones where multiple reviewers say the same thing, because that's clearly a problem. But list all the problems. Take away the jokes. Take away the, 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 the entertainment from the review. Just be specific. What needs to change? Where are the problems? And then when you have the checklist, it doesn't feel so upsetting anymore doesn't feel so hurtful anymore. It's just a list of things to do. Fix the characterization, move the band so they're less confusing, remove this character, doesn't look so interesting, change the order of those songs, uh, lose song number five, it doesn't work. And then you can make changes quickly, even under the most intense pressure, which is what she was facing. And a few weeks later, the show Moving Out premiered on Broadway, and the media came, and the New York Times said, it's a shimmering portrait of an American generation. Another reviewer said, it's a blast. Another reviewer said, it's in a different league. The show ran for years. It won two Tony Awards, but the, including for Twyla Tharp's choreography. The most interesting review for me is when Newsday, the magazine that had reprinted one of the Chicago reviews, they flew the Chicago reviewer down he said, we want you to write an updated review. And so he wrote his review. He said, yeah, it's good. It's a good show. He said, I can't ever remember a show improving so much between the first tryouts and the Broadway premiere. How did this happen? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves more often. It's fine to look at success and say, oh, success is nice, I want success. It's fine to look at failure and say, failure is frightening, I don't want failure. But where we really start to improve is when we look at the path from failure to success and ask that question, how did it happen? Because that's what's going on all around us in the world today. I hope I've told you something about the art of good mistakes. I'm very happy to take questions, but thank you all very much for listening. So, good afternoon. Uh, so, good afternoon. So, my name is Antoine Bozio. I'm a professor at PSC and uh, director of the uh, Institut des Politiques Publiques, IPP, which aims to uh, 
be the French IFS, which is a very ambitious task. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Tim, for this great talk. So we're going to have questions, so please uh, so raise your hand and um, say who you are and, uh, and, and ask the question. If you want to ask a question in, in French, and I'll be happy to try to translate into English. I'll kickstart with some questions for Tim so that you, you have time to think about your questions. Um, so, um, so during during your talk, so I was thinking about mistakes that, and typically thinking about policy mistakes that are hard to fit into what you describe as the the trials and the errors that actually you can try and try again at little cost. There are some decisions, typically collective decisions, uh, um, politics or questions that. Are, involve all of us that are by so nature difficult to just oh, let's do a referendum again in the UK or let's try to do I mean how do you do, do you think that what you describe that goes well with typically a lot of the or or careers everyday life or of business within the market can be applied to the big questions or the policy questions um, yeah, we definitely have another referendum. It, it, it always works. Um, the people are always right. So you, you're right. It, sometimes this is very hard to do. Uh, sometimes it's impossible to do. Um, but I think it's worth always thinking about, well, how can we get a, a little bit closer? So with any, um, any policy that isn't pure macroeconomics, you can always uh, gather good quality data to find out whether the policy is working. You can often run a randomized controlled trial. I don't say that these are always the solution, but very often it, it works just fine. Very often you have a policy, say for example you want to um, change the way that um, uh, pris the prison system makes decisions about um, parole. Who do you release from prison and when and on what circumstances? So maybe you have a new idea about this. Well, all such decisions will not be rolled out across the country instantly. They'll always be tried out gradually somewhere. So if you are systematic about that and you, try, you do it on a randomized basis, you say, well, we're going to try here and uh, we're going to try in 10 places, and in 10 other places we don't try it, but we'll randomize the order in which they're introduced. You can learn a tremendous amount just from better design of the introduction of the policy that you were going to produce anyway. Um, so very often you find there's a way to learn a lot more and a lot more quickly from policies if we want to. Now, then the question is, well, do politicians actually want to? Uh, and I think the answer is often no. Politicians don't want to know whether their policies work because they would rather just declare that they work. Uh, and they certainly don't want very good quality evidence proving that something works or, or that something might not work. So I think that that's down to us then. We as voters have to change the political calculus. We have to say, look, I want to see good quality evidence of the policies that you are, you're trying out. And I will forgive you if you try something, come up with evidence, it doesn't work, that's okay, as long as, you, as long as you keep doing it, as long as you stop once you've discovered it doesn't work. And I think to do that, two things. One is, some of this has to be pushed down to a more technocratic level. So one positive step I saw in the UK is um, they created something called the Education Endowment Foundation. Ministers in the UK, this would never happen in France, I'm sure, but in the UK, ministers are always messing with the schools, always always telling the teachers what to teach um, because it's a very politically loaded topic. So they created the Education Endowment Foundation. They said, we'll give you money. I think it's about 80 million euros. Um, you run experiments as to the best way to teach, the best way to spend more resources. Is it better to have better computers, better classrooms, more teachers, better paid teachers, more classroom assistants? Um, is it better to stream students by ability or to mix them in together? These are important questions. We can find out the answers to these questions. But the government put that to the technocrats, and then the technocrats produce the recommendations, and then it's not the government's fault when some things don't work. The second thing is, can we make our experiments uh, like Paul McCready's aeroplane? Can we learn really fast? Sometimes no. 
Sometimes you're going to test out the effect of uh, a preschool program on life chances. You have to wait 20 years. There's no alternative. But often you can, you can make policy improvements and you can learn really quickly. And in the UK, again, the behavioral insight team, which was set up by David Cameron, um, has been running experiments that produce clear results in six weeks. Not always the most important stuff, but then you start to make a case that these experiments can teach us things. Okay, thank you. I think it's quite clear. So, questions from the room? Yes? Yes, I was interested you mentioned randomized control trials because... Sorry. I was interested you mentioned randomized control trials because when I was listening to your presentation, I actually thought, you know, on two of the four points you mentioned, the way we're currently doing RCTs is sort of uh, going against what you say, which is that typically, you know, they have to be done at scale, so they have to be quite big, uh, and they take a long time, partly for that reason, and then they don't give specific feedback. They tend to say, this worked, or this didn't work, because we want to make sure that we have statistical power, so we don't want to look at things like, we don't have too many differences, like, does it work better this way or better that way? We just want to say, you know, What's the overall effect big? So do you think economics maybe is going the wrong way in trying to evaluate? Maybe we should be doing more you know, qualitative work that could be you know, done on a smaller scale, quicker feedback? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. There is a tension here. Um, the most rigorous randomized trial is huge. It's pre-registered. So you tell everybody exactly what you're going to do before you do it. So you can't hide results that, that aren't convenient. Um, you have a, you're very, very, very high-powered, um, quite um, slow-moving process. And then you have the Cochrane collaboration come along and they gather up all of the randomized controlled trials, but they privilege the, you know, the very highest quality. Uh, and so lots of lower quality work doesn't get included at all. Um, so that's, that gives you the very best randomized controlled trial. But if you say, well, what gives you the very best learning Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's much more attention to qualitative details. It's much more attention to learning on the job. I, while I was running the trial, I spotted there's a problem and I had to fix the problem. Well, if you do that on a drugs trial, the drugs trial is not valid. But it might still be a good way of learning. Um, I don't know really how to, um, to deal with the tension except to say there is value in both. Um, we can do both. It, then they, randomized trials are expensive, but they're not nearly as expensive as just making policy with not knowing what's going on. So I think we need that sensitivity to, to both. But um, what I would add is we see problems in psychology now from too many trials that are quick and dirty, not high-powered enough, and they're all now being overturned. They're all being discredited. It's, uh, it's really unbelievable how serious the situation now seems to be in psychology. I wonder the the experiments I've reported now, you know, how many of them would stand up? I, I, I hope that these are accurate, but... Um, so the, the randomized trials, yes, they need to be quick, they need to be cheap, but they, they need to be big enough and expensive enough, otherwise you've, you've just got junk. Jean-Marc? Uh, just to follow up on that, so I mean, since we are in academic uh, world here, and I'm more in the theory side, and I could relate basically to yeah, three of the four points that we are making. I mean, there's definitely a lot of conformism, social pressure, you might uh, want to call it, but uh, conformism in the kind of idea that one is developing, and you know, there are these fads, or in, in a way, and and we feel awkward if we do something different. Uh, there is also it's difficult to judge if an idea is a success or not, if it's just interesting and, and you know, whether people find it interested or not, what, what is the right criteria. And there's also what you are, uh, what you are describing at the end, the, 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 you know, when you get review or referee reports and you tend to be mad and uh, well, they, don't, they didn't understand or whatever and so you have to calm down. And, uh, but it's more about yeah, doing the, the quick and dirty kind of thing is uh, where I relate less to what we could do uh, to improve things, uh, to, uh, to develop ideas. And uh, I remember one of my professors telling me also, the, and this goes back also to the psychology aspect uh, that you mentioned, loss aversion and some other uh, biases, is one of the most difficult things you will have to, to judge by yourself is when is your research program a dead end? 
And uh, it's true that very often we have to switch subjects, switch topics, and it's very difficult to, to know how it is. And I think you mentioned loss aversion, but there are some, uh, many other biases that are uh, in some cost fallacy, confirmation bias, that you are going to look for the, the right uh, advice, or uh, you won't listen to the, the people who tell you that uh, what you're doing is just uh, not interesting at all. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we can, I think, as academics, really relate to that. So yeah, I guess it's not really a question uh, and more a comment on uh, how this can be applied to, to the life of, uh, of academics. The, the question I had uh, is related to Frank. So you described him as losing it, in a way. Uh, but listening to you also, I mean, the, the loss aversion uh, phenomenon in Kahneman and Tversky is both this you don't like losing, but it's, as you described it also, it's, uh, you tend to take more risk when you are in the loss domain. And from what you were saying at the beginning, taking risk is a, is a good thing. So isn't there a way to frame things in the loss domain rather than the gain domain so that people would uh, tend to take more risk and be more innovative sometimes, uh, even though this goes against the, the original loss aversion that you don't like losing. But once you know that you are going to lose, uh, you tend to take more risk and try things that uh, you wouldn't try if you were in the gain domain. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting observation. The, um, and there, is an, there is an argument that socially we don't take enough risk uh, and that therefore uh, if we can trick people into, into taking more risks, even though it's not rational for them, maybe very convenient for the rest of us. Uh, fortunately, we have a supply of highly overconfident entrepreneurs, it seems, so we're, we're okay, I think, a little bit on that. Um, on, on the subject of um, academics and, and getting into dead-end research, uh, it, you are, you're, you're right that the, the, the quick and dirty approach is, is perhaps more useful outside academia where you're in a competitive market, you're, you're trying to make decisions very quickly, whereas with, with academia, what you ultimately want is secure knowledge. I don't want, I don't want quick, uh, quick th ideas that, that don't, don't necessarily last. I want to be able to produce things that we can all rely on and trust, and so maybe that takes time. So that's okay. There's a, there's a time and a place for everything. Um, but I have been thinking about the, the academics problem um, in, in my new book, Messy, and thinking particularly about the problem of cross-disciplinary research. So you described groupthink is often a problem in academia, not just academia, it's a problem for, for many groups. You like to hang around with people who agree with you um, and who support your views, it's much more comfortable. Um, I checked my Twitter feed this morning, there's nobody saying, this is wonderful that the Americans have elected Donald Trump, nobody. Somebody must have voted for him. <laughs> Same thing with Brexit. Nobody in my Twitter feed thought it was a good idea. 52% of the British voters did think it was a good idea. So we, it's very easy to surround yourself with people who agree with you and then you can very quickly form mistaken views about the world. Um, so I, I talk about this problem in Messi and how do we encourage more diversity, more interdisciplinary research. It's difficult because we, even when someone with a different view uh, comes into our group, and when they actually help us solve a problem, we've got some really nice experimental evidence on this, where the stranger is introduced to the group, the group becomes a better problem-solving unit. Even then, afterwards, you ask people, was it helpful to have the stranger to say no? Do you think you did a good job? No, it was really awkward, this idiot um, getting in the way. Uh, whereas when you talk to the groups, the homogenous groups, the groups of friends, and you say, how are things? They go, oh yeah, great, we, we did a great job, we solved all the problems. So, and actually, these groups have completely failed. So um, we, know we need to try to embrace people who disagree with us more than we, we would like to. So interdisciplinary schools are, are important. This perhaps is one upside of uh, some of the big problems we face, for example, climate change. When you give people a really big problem like climate change, the problem is naturally interdisciplinary. People are forced to work together. The computer scientists have to talk to the economists. They have to talk to the climate scientists and the oceanographers. They have to all work together because the problem demands it. And the evidence is in those circumstances you can get more cross-disciplinary working. So we just need a nice supply of 
interesting but not too dangerous problems. <laughs> the question, yes. And I'm moving a little bit from academia to, I, I am in academia right now. I started in venture capital and incubators, now in academia, so here goes to failure. But um, I always notice in certain startup environments that um, uh, the, the team would come into the room when they're about to get uh, chosen or get uh, a question and there will always be a female element because right now they have quotas and things like that. And the female element will always be the one who would feel more comfortable talking about exit strategies. And in your talk, uh, the only element that you talked that had a learning curve and was propensed to listen and to have feedback was a woman. So I wanted to understand if you can talk about gender failure and learning curve. Thank you. So it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, and I think as with other forms of diversity, we, um, we tend to take it for granted in the mainstream dialogue which is mostly two white guys on a stage uh, just talking about you know, how they see the world. Uh, and so we, even when we think that we've, we, uh, we get it, yeah, we get diversity, we understand, we're, we're, you know, we're modern guys. We don't really, so we, we miss things. Um, so the evidence, this I talk about a lot in, in my new book, Messy, which is, um, will be coming in, uh, in French soon, but is available in English. And since I'm talking to you in English, I guess you could read it in English. Um, so I talk about the research on this, how we, we so often underestimate the benefits of, of all different kinds of diversity, including uh, gender diversity, but racial diversity, diversity of experience, of age. We underestimate it. When we see it, it makes us uncomfortable. Then we deny that we're uncomfortable, but we we behave as though we're uncomfortable. Um, so th this is a real problem, and we need to try and do more about it. There is a very interesting uh, piece of research that I'm writing about in next weekend's Financial Times that has come out of um, thinking about the, the biases we've been talking about, and is there a way to fix the biases? So uh, this came from the UK government's behavioral insight team. And they said, OK, let's think about how we make uh, decisions on hiring somebody. Because we've, we've talked about you know, Airbnb and Uber and so on, and we, this is a hot topic, diversity there. The hashtag Airbnb while black. Um, but the big, one of the biggest decisions of all is who gets hired. So you see the application form. Okay, what's on the application form? Number one, your name. Okay, so now I know probably your gender, your uh, maybe your nationality, your ethnicity, uh, maybe your class, lots of things I know can... Of course, I would never... My judgment would never be influenced by that, but I know it. Then I see your school. Again, probably I'm over-influenced by that. Then I see your summer internships, your summer work placements. Well, that's really a, just a measure of your contacts. So the first things I see are... Your, your gender, your race, your contacts, your, your social grouping, everything. Then I see the answers to my application questions. Well, as long as I'm not influenced by anything I've seen, then I can evaluate those questions completely neutrally. But of course I am influenced by what, by what I've seen, because we all are. Um, also, this is not to do with di diversity, but just if your first answer is good, then I have a tendency to think your second answer is also good and your third answer is also good, even if your second answer is bad, or vice versa. Or, let's say the person who applied before you is a very smart guy. I read his, I read his application form and I think, this guy's a genius. Then I read yours. Yours just doesn't seem as good, and I downgrade it, even though actually maybe you're the second best applicant, and you should be, and because you came right after the best applicant, you seem bad. Or maybe... The, the person who applies is not a genius at all, he's an idiot. Now I think you're a genius, because I read your application form after the idiot. So this is, none of this is, is wise. And this is absolutely the way we, we interview for jobs. So the Behavioral Insight team says, well, how do, we, how do we get rid of these cognitive biases? Yeah, you can train people to be better people, you can try, or you can just take away the problem. So now, you feed the application form into the computer, and now, as the recruiter, what's the first thing I see? I don't see your name, your gender, your race, nothing. 
I see an, an answer. Not necessarily to question one, maybe the answer to question four. And I can just grade that answer in isolation. Is it a good answer? Then I see another answer to another question. Is it yours? Is it his? Is it I don't know whose answer it is. They're all coming in isolation. All I see is the answer and I grade it. This is good, this is not. So, so many of these cognitive biases have now been removed. And what's more, we can have three or four recruiters and they can all see a mixture of different answers from different people. You get the wisdom of crowds. So they've, they've just started experimenting on this and what they found is they ran two processes side by side. They couldn't run a randomized trial because you have to be fair to everybody, but they graded everybody twice. And they said all the people who get through the traditional process and all the people who get through the new process, we invite them all to an assessment center. And then we have a very structured, very well designed assessment center. Well, the, the new application process, the de-biased application process, much, much closer correlation with the assessment center performance. Whereas the traditional application process is not a good predictor at all of performance in the assessment center. And then of course, the next question is, does it also predict performance in the job? So here's a situation where you have our biases fighting against both justice and also efficiency. And you ask the right questions from behavioral economics and then you run the experiment and potentially you can, you can make things better. But it's a huge issue, so thank you for raising it. Thank you. Um, five more minutes for some more questions. One, one final question. One final question somewhere, someone. No one wants to ask about Brexit or Trump. That's good, we like that. Yes? Whether well, over-reliance on data, pure data, well, we seem to be swimming in statistics and data, and whether that is becoming a kind of group behavior. Because it's big data, it's good. I'm thinking about the polls and the predictions and what actually happened. Yes, I think we are now uh, starting to get seduced by big data and making very old statistical errors. I'm a huge fan of, of data, I'm a huge fan of statistics. I present a show for the BBC all about the joy of statistics and the way that statistics help us understand uh, the, the world around us. But we have to get them right. And um, I, I wrote a piece for the Financial Times you could look up if you're interested called uh, Big Data, Are We Making a Big Mistake? Um, it was the most read piece in the FT website in the whole of 2014. So I think the answer is some people clearly think that maybe we are making a big mistake. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the issues which I discuss in my book, Messy, is that of course data will always miss something important. You cannot capture everything in the numbers. And sometimes what's important is really important. What's missing is really important. But the other issue is <coughs> when you have these big data processes, they're not very transparent. They're certainly not transparent to society because a lot of the data is secret. Facebook's data is secret, Google's data is secret. But also they're not, often not really transparent even to the people who are analyzing them. They don't necessarily fully understand what they're doing. And so you, you see people making old mistakes with new data. Um, so for example, a very familiar mistake is the sample uh, selection bias problem. You, you, you're just missing an important group out of your data. Um, and a classic example of, of this happening recently is in Boston, where they decided, oh, Boston gets a lot of um, potholes because it gets very cold in the, in the winter. How can we identify the potholes? I know we will get people to download an app onto their phones, and the app will talk to the accelerometer. And when you drive along the Boston streets, if you hit a pothole, your phone bumps in your pocket, pings City Hall and says, come and, feed the, uh, um, come and fix the pothole. And if you get several people bumping in the same place, then you learn there's a pothole. And you think, well, no, that's, a, that's a pretty good use of big data. And it is, it's, that, that's great. Um, except it's a systematic um, machine for identifying potholes in the neighborhoods of people who are wealthy enough to have smartphones and who are clued in enough to have downloaded the app from City Hall and completely omits, and this is six, seven years ago, so there were a lot, of, a lot of people who did not have smartphones who were systematically being missed out of this process. Now, that's okay if you recognize it and if you have other processes as well, that's fine. And I think that actually the city of Boston did spot pretty quickly they had an issue. 
Um, but that's the kind of thing, it's, it's a very easy mistake to make. I don't want to say, and therefore, data is bad, data is not bad, data is great, numbers are our friends. Uh, in a cold world, numbers are the only thing that give me comfort. Uh, I'm an economist. But, you know, we, we, we need to be careful, we need to understand what we're doing. And particularly when they get plugged into computers and turned into wonderful visualizations like the one I showed you, we can get drawn in and think that we're really understanding the world when often there's something important missing. So thanks for your question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim, for this uh, great talk on a great uh, series of questions and answers. So uh, we're very happy to have you here. And uh, for those who uh, wanted to have a look at the book in French, it's... Uh, at yeah. the uh, entrance. Indeed, and, and indeed some other good books that are not by me, but I won't mind if you buy those instead, that's okay. But yes, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.